Excellent. So what I'm going to talk about today is regarding the athletic hip and pain in the athletic hip. And uh, there's a term, of course, femoral acetabular impingement is something that's thrown around a lot or FAI for short. Uh, and it's almost somewhat of a household term at this point, uh, especially in the doctor's office. But what I'm going to try to convince you all is maybe that that uh, should be a diagnosis of exclusion rather than inclusion. And pl please feel free to, call, to ask any questions in the process. So my, my thought here initially is uh, to present a case quickly to demonstrate the point. And this is a 56-year-old guy. He complains of chest pain. Yes, orthopedists do see some degree of medicine as well, uh, as you guys know. And the, the, you know the, this patient's getting worse. He's localized the central left side of the chest, achy, runny nose, et cetera. And really no radiation down the arm. Feels a little better when he sits up. So uh, one could suggest that perhaps he needs surgery for this and an open heart surgery. But alternatively, that's a problem with the incorrect diagnosis. In other words, just because you have chest pain, it doesn't mean it's cardiac related, but rather all he probably needs is a PPI because he has some heartburn. So the same thing is true of the hip. And what I mean in that, you can treat it with H2 blockers. Um, and interestingly, there, there are a lot of these that are out there. Um, this is a Regenex uh, statement that said, if patient present with hip pain and impingement on MRI, uh, they need a surgeon, shouldn't they potentially try other options? 42.6% of patients without hip pain had imaging findings with FAI, and instead, let's inject stem cells. And what I would suggest is that it's not so much that they need stem cells or even, frankly, need surgery, but rather hip pain does not mean you have impingement. It just means you have hip pain. And there are a lot of reasons to have hip pain, and most of them are non-operative. Um, so this is an example of all of the different things that can cause hip pain. And this was published by Cohesi in, 20, in 2006. And I, I would suggest that any one of these can cause patients to come in and say, my hip hurts. And at that point, if you get an x-ray of their hip and it shows a cam deformity, which is a bump on the ball, or a pincer deformity, which is a deep socket, at that point, it would be very easy to suggest that, well, you, you have a bump on your hip and you have hip pain, and therefore you must have impingement and let's do surgery. Uh, but perhaps one does not necessarily equal the other. So location matters. And I try to break this down in my head in the following way. So if patients describe anterior hip pain on their, his, on their history, usually they don't say, I, my hip hurts in the front, they'll just say my hip hurts. And if you try to localize exactly where that is, it can be very helpful. So patients that have anterior hip or groin pain, usually either have a muscle strain, iliopsoas bursitis, which is your hip flexor, they could have arthritis, or they could have FAI and a labral tear, among other things. Uh, if they describe lateral hip pain, so they'll say, you know, it really sleep, it hurts when I sleep on my side or I can't lie down on my side or it hurts when I run and they point to the side of their hip and they say my hip hurts here. Well, that's not really the hip joint. That's more an area where, which is called the greater trochanter. I know there are orthopedists in this, and so forgive me for dumbing, dumbing this down to some degree, but uh, this is kind of how I think out of it. So greater trochanteric bursitis. They could, if they're a little bit older, have a gluteus medius or a minimus abductor tear. They could have iliotibial band so syndrome that's radiating proximally. Um, if they describe posterior hip pain, sort of buttock-related hip pain, uh, then it may be a hamstring tendonitis, hamstring tendon tear, or neuropathies, kind of radiation from the back. So for me, I try to break it down into static and dynamic factors. And static factors, at, at least as far as I'm concerned, are people who describe pain with standing. This is not so much dynamic, like I sit or I squat, but more I stand or walk and my hip hurts. And usually that's not impingement. Impinge, FAI or people who have impingement usually don't have pain with standing. If they have muscle tendonitis, they don't have pain with standing. It's more a dysplasia or arthritic overload of the hip. Uh, they may have cartilage loss with early arthritis or severe arthritis. And the pictures on the bottom right, what you can see there is a person who is severely dysplastic and subluxating anteriorly. Those people are standing on a ceiling that's very, very small. And so they get overload of their socket and they have pain with strict, just normal standing and they actually prefer to sit. So the treatment in this case is not putting a camera in their hip and scoping them, but rather completely changing the socket depth with something called the periacetabular osteotomy. And that's described on the, or shown on the left picture or they could have large cartilage loss. So this picture shows uh, an area of a young, of one, a young patient of mine, a 22-year-old medical student, who has significant cartilage loss on the dome of, his fe on his dome of his femur and his acetabulum. And in this case, we actually did an allograft transplant with a surgical dislocation. This is not a hip scope. This is not impingement. Alternatively, you could have a 42-year-old guy that looks like this, and you can't treat that with a scope either. That's a person who would rather sit rather than stand, and he doesn't like to stand because he's standing on a socket that doesn't have very good cartilage, and as a result, uh, he has pain. And so this isn't treated with a camera. This is treated with a joint replacement. 
So on the other side, you have dynamic factors, and that's sort of an abnormal stress and contact area in the femoral head. And these people, more often than not, either have impingement or iliopsoas tendonitis, and it has to do with a dynamic impact of the ball in the socket. And again, I know a lot of you know all of this, but it's a very brief background. Other compensatory injuries of individuals with impingement type shaped hips, morphology, sports hernia, athletic pubalgia. So their description is a little bit different. It's not so much sitting that bothers them, but rather doing a formal crunch. And they describe it more up in the lower abdominal area rather than the groin. Osteitis pubis can happen. Obviously this can be present in, in pregnant women and after pregnancy. Uh, sacroiliitis can happen because of the rotational impact with subsequent uh, injury to the sacroiliac joint, and this can be treated with non-surgical non management, including injections. They may get muscle injuries like avulsions. Uh, you could also get posterior hip subluxations when the cam deformity on the front hit impacts the front of the acetabulum, and they could dislocate the hip. So my general exam maneuvers in this case, this is back when I had some hair at least, um, it was an anterior basically performing the impingement test. So flexing the hip up, adducting it, bringing it across the body and rotating it. And that's what we call the fader or impingement test. And patients will say it hurts, but if you ask them, does it hurt in the groin? They may say, no, not really. It hurts elsewhere, laterally, for instance. So usually what I'll ask in all of these is, does this replicate the pain that you're here for? And a lot of times they say no. The suprolateral impingement test is generally looking for lateral greater trochanteric impingement or impingement along for pincer lesions. You can do posterior rim impingement, which is more common with people who have severe antiversion of the hip, um, but more common with dysplasia. Um, and lateral impingement test. So that's greater extra articular impingement, like the greater trochanter on the acetabulum or pelvis. So for me, this is how I break it down. Effectively, Femoral acetabular impingement, those patients, they hate sitting. They much prefer to stand. So one of my the questions that I rely on the most is if I forced you to stand or sit for two hours, which would you rather do? If they have impingement, they always say they'd rather stand. They never say they'd rather sit. In fact, most of these patients suggest that they've got standing desks at their work because they just can't sit. Now, dysplastic is the opposite. These patients would sit all day long. They hate standing. They hate walking. Uh, so it's an, a static versus a dynamic overload. Now, femoral stress fractures, usually those patients have groin pain with axial loading. And all of you in the audience probably know the history is common. It's, I, I'm a high level runner. I took some time off, maybe a few months to a year. And now I'm getting back and training for a marathon. Next thing you know, my hip starts hurting when I run a few miles and it gets worse. But when I rest, it feels better. Uh, that's not an impingement patient. That's a femoral neck stress fracture with that history. Internal snapping hip is usually in the younger female athletes. They describe a hip dislocating in a sense or a popping in the groin. Um, sometimes they can have pain with this, other times not. Oftentimes their moms will bring them in. It's usually the female dancers in their early adolescence. That really freaks them out because the, the, the girl will sit there and pop it and say, mom, I'm fine, but the mom will get a little freaked out. But the truth of the matter is, this is something that almost always they end up growing out of. And even if they don't, the treatment for this, in my opinion, the morbidity is not worth it. There are a lot of described treatments for this, and that's releasing the iliopsoas tendon arthroscopically. But I can tell you they have a huge amount of hip flexor weakness after this. And a lot of patients are more unhappy after than they are before the actual surgery. External snapping hip, that's the iliotibial band or tensor fascia lata, and they can show that too. It's the same population, the dancers, the gymnasts. They describe popping back and forth of the iliotibial band. A lot of the times they can show it to you. You put your hand on the outside of the hip, and then they sit there and pop it for you. And they, see, they say, see, this is how it dislocates. It's the same trajectory. Effectively, that's stretching, physical therapy, straight, stretching, strengthening the gluteal muscles and the core muscles, and a lot of times that goes away. Greater trochanteric bursitis or greater, greater trochanteric pain sy syndrome is a little bit of a pain. Uh, it imitates that of iliotibial band syndrome because it's the same traject it's the same anatomic structure, uh, but it more, more localizes to the greater trochanter versus down at the knee. Treatment's the same, rolling anti-inflammatories. In my experience, surgery for this is not great. A lot of injections can help with this, both diagnostic and therapeutic. We'll do a lot of ultrasound guided bursal injections with corticosteroids. Uh, you don't want to do it a lot, once or twice tops, uh, but it is something that's not unreasonable. We can talk about biologics as well with this if you'd like. Avulsions is obviously your early adolescence in, in kiddos. Usually they describe an eccentric load. They can pull it off the ischium. They can have ASIS, AIS avulsions. In almost all cases, these are non-surgical with a couple exceptions.
The adductor tears, usually these are individuals who do forced eccentric abduction. This is generally football players or gymnasts that land, their leg slides out to the side and they pull off the adductor uh, tendon from the pubic symphysis. Uh, these are always non-surgical. Uh, every single study that's looked at these, the answer is don't operate on them. They do better with just watchful, watchful waiting. Last but not least, the sports hernia. These individuals usually have crunching pain. They describe doing a formal crunch or sit up with pain or a, a valsalva maneuver. So the hypermobile hip here deserve, deserves some degree of uh, spe specific discussion. These are the dancers, the gymnasts, figure skaters, wrestlers also fall into this category. Uh, they often have the internal external snapping hip we talked about. They're very prone to psoas tendonitis, trochanteric bursitis. They describe sensations of instability. They may have uh, instability of their shoulders and knees as well. Um, careful history and physical exam is important. For me, I always check Baton criteria on these. So the, this is an example of the Baton criteria. The higher number of these they can do, the more likely it is to be concerning and hypermobile. Once they get up in that seven, eight, nine out of nine scale, you start to get very concerned. And these individuals, sometimes I'll send for genetic testing if they're full nine out of nine. FAI can occur with these individuals, particularly with high kicks. So for instance, your gymnasts or dancers, um, figure skaters as well, that describe when they put their foot over their head, they have groin pain. And what I suggest, su would suggest to you is this is not so much a bone problem as it is a motion problem. They can do things with their hips that others of us can't. And at the end of the day, impingement will happen if you put your foot high enough. So for my treatment for these individuals. This is conservative. If you, if I tried to put my foot over my head all day, my hip would hurt, hurt too. And I'm not necessarily sure surgery is the right answer here. So we, I, we, we always tread lightly with these individuals. Sometimes surgery is indicated, but always as a last resort. And we always make sure we repair the capsule with these, we, these individuals after surgery uh, before they come off the OR table because they are very much prone to iatrogenic instability of their hip. And they can actually dislocate after surgery. So you got to be very careful with those. Um, never ever touch the iliopsoas tendon. They oftentimes will have internal snapping hip. Some may feel like, you know what, while I'm in there, I'm just going to release that iliopsoas to make you feel better or relieve that snapping. I would suggest to you that the studies, as well as my own personal experience with this, is that is a bad idea. This iliopsoas tendon is a dynamic stabilizer of anterior hip instability. And if you release it, they can become unstable. Physical therapy, from my perspective, is a mainstay with all of these individuals. It helps you get to know your patients. Hip patients are very different than knee and shoulder patients, honestly. They're more like spine patients in a way that you need to get to know them. They often have concomitant pathology, and it's better to take it nice and slow and get to understand who your patients are and who needs to be indicated. So can we narrow it down a bit? I'm going to try. Anteriorly, this is a 40-year-old man, 10 years of episodic anterior hip pain. He hurts with impact activities, skiing, running, jumping. Sitting and squatting hurt him. He prefers to sit rather than stand. He's tried anti-inflammatories. He has a positive impingement test. He also hurts with an axial load and log roll. So here is x-rays. This was a person that was sent to me with an MRI for a labral tear. I would suggest to you that this is, labral tear is not his problem. Impingement, he also has a cam deformity, but he also has florid arthritis, specifically on the right. And despite the fact that he's an early 40-year-old guy, I mean, he's my age, uh, unfortunately, this is a surgical treatment that is not as arthroscopic management. That's a hip replacement. So what do we do for this? They say, doc, I'm 41 years old. I don't want a hip replacement. You got to scope my hip. What I tell them is, unfortunately, I can scope your hip, but I will make you different, not better. And at the end of the day, there are other options we have. So what about DJD? Well, there are a lot of options here. Home exercise programs, maybe help, maybe not. They definitely aren't going to hurt in terms of the overall outcome because muscle strengthening will improve their outcomes after a hip replacement, but it probably won't do much for their pain. As far as injections, the answer here is that it's all over the map. Corticosteroids injections are still a mainstay from my perspective. We all know that they have the consequences, your increased risk of infection if you do a hip replacement after a steroid within three months. The uh, longer you wait, the better off you are in terms of lowering your risk of infection after total hip. That being said, it does have early uh, early treatment with corticosteroid injections has some reasonable results. We talk about PRP and stem cells. I will tell you the stem cell data is not there. It's not worth the money and the data isn't, isn't supported anyway. PRP, interestingly, does have some reasonable data here. Leukocyte poor PRP for hip intraarticular hip problems has reasonable effectiveness for up to six months. If your patients are willing to pay out of pocket for it, it's not an unreasonable option. That being said, insurance companies do not cover it, but there are randomized control trials that suggest it is reasonable. And I suspect in the future, insurance will cover leukocyte poor PRP for hip injections for young patients with intraarticular arthritis.
So as far as follow up here, he got into articular corticosteroid injection. He returned to activities at, at ADLs. We're going to continue to monitor him. He understands that he's going to need a hip replacement at some point, but we're going to try to kick that can down the road. This is a 42-year-old man with six months of groin pain. Same idea, activity. He hurts with stair climbing, hiking, um, as well as sitting down and squatting. He can't jog or ski. He's tried anti-inflammatories. Still has a positive impingement test. He has a stench field, so maybe some concerns about iliopsoas tendonitis. So here are his x-rays. Totally different situation here. At this point, the joint space looks good. He has a small cam deformity. There's loss of sphericity. But overall, not too bad. Here's his MRI. He has a labral tear that you can see on that uh, radial sequence on, on this right-hand side. His cartilage looks well-preserved. Maybe there's a hair of early chondrosis on the lateral side of the acetabulum, but overall, a very well-preserved hip, and the cam deformity is evident. That's the labral tear demonstrated by the circle. You can see it again here. Um, interestingly, along this zone, you can also see fluid in the iliopsoas tendon. Um, so that's coming right over the top of the front of the hip. So the question becomes here, is it the labrum? He has a cam, he has a labral tear. You could argue that maybe we should do surgery on this, but he interestingly also has a stench field and he has fluid in the iliopsoas tendon. So I would say in this case, this is, the, in my opinion, the downside of doing an MR arthrogram. A lot of radiologists will suggest, you know, you got to do an arthrogram to make sure that we see the labral tear. What I would suggest to all of you is that is actually probably a mistake. Arthrograms have been used historically because they increase our ability to identify labral tears. That being said, I'm going to try to convince you it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, people have labral tears whether they have hip pain or not. So whether you see the labral tear or you don't see the labral tear, it's not going to change your ultimate management decision making. But rather, if you obstruct your ability to see the iliopsoas tendon, it will. So this is a person with an arthrogram, and you see the iliopsoas muscle and tendon light up like a Christmas tree. That is not because they have tendinosis. That's because they stuck arthrogram dye in the iliopsoas tendon as they were coming into the joint. So you can't identify in this MR whether or not this person has iliopsoas tendonitis or a labral tear or both. So for me, I never get arthrograms except in very rare circumstances of revision, hip arthroscopy, where I'm worrying about capsule. And I will say that's very uncommon. So from my perspective, initial 4A here, do an MR non-arthrogram study and your patients will thank you. Uh, this is an individual that I described. He had iliopsoas tendinosis. So the initial treatment here is an ultrasound guided to show a sheath injection with corticosteroids. Um, it took all of his pain away. He never needed surgery. Ultimately, he did great. The way I differentiate that on exam is I will do the impingement test and then I'll do the stinch field test. The stinch field test with a patient lying flat, you lift the leg up about 20 degrees of hip flexion, knee, leg straight, and push down as they lift up. If that reproduces their pain, that's iliopsoas tendonitis. That is not impingement. They hurt in the same place, but they hurt differently, and the patients can differentiate between the two. What about treatment for this? Well, the answer is physical therapy, anti-inflammatories, and corticosteroid injections, and they do great. And usually it just takes one. I don't like to re-inject the iliopsoas tendon multiple times for obvious reasons. It's not good for the tendon, but it can do very, very good things in, in terms of allowing the patients to go back to physical therapy. So he got pain relief. He's doing great. Didn't need surgery. He's very happy with his process. Uh, and I had to explain to him why he didn't need surgery for his labral tear, uh, but ultimately his return to activity bore the picture out for him. What about lateral hip pain? Well, trochanteric bursitis or greater trochanteric pain syndrome is called that for a reason. Ultimately, it's lateral sided pain, and we have no idea why. There are lots of different reasons. We can substratify, though. So a lot of patients will get MRIs of their pelvis for these. They will see, tro they, they will see partial tendons, abductor tendon tears. They'll see bursal bursitis. They'll see possible tendonitis. And so sorting through that MRI is sometimes difficult. I would suggest first step here is always physical therapy. You can try dry needling, dry needling with physical therapists. They work very well. You can try corticosteroid injections. Again, be careful here. Usually one is fine. I wouldn't do multiple can it, because it can degrade the tendon. Um, gluteal tendinopathy, this is a reasonable perspective. It's from Brit British Medical Journal in terms of how to substratify these. Wait and see, corticosteroid injections and education and exercises, ultimately they all do well. A lot of times patients need the injection to convince them that they can, they can actually do physical therapy, so it's more of a psychological issue. So this is a 64-year-old female, right lateral hip pain of two years. She'd been treated with bursitis. She had physical therapy over six months. She'd had four corticosteroid injections. She got temporary relief with the first one, but otherwise they haven't been working. She can't sleep through the night. She can't bike. She can't hike. She has tentative palpation of the greater trochanter. And she has what I, what, what I have termed the Dreyevich sign. So this is actually comes from <clears throat> excuse me, a physical therapist, an athletic trainer named Pete Dreyevich. 
And he taught me this. He was in Manhattan at the time. And this is an interesting test that I found very useful. So if you have the patient lay on their non-painful side and bring their hip into abduction, so bring it away from the body, extend the hip, so bring it behind their buttock and internally rotate them and then have, let the leg go and ask them to hold it there. If they have purely bursitis and pain, they can hold it there, but it hurts. If they have a true gluteal tendon tear that is symptomatic, they, their hip falls into obligatory abduction, external rotation, flexion, and it falls in and out. And they cannot hold the leg there. They try, but they can't do it. And it's not just pain related. They literally can't do it. So it's the equivalent of what we call the empty can sign or Job sign for rotator cuff tears. And this is very, very sensitive and specific for a true glute, gluteal tendon tear that requires surgery. So here are her x-rays, overall pretty well-preserved joint, maybe a little dysplastic, which is not surprising given the overload of her abductors through, throughout her life. Um, she's not having any intraarticular pathology, but what you see on the, the MRI here on the, right, the left-hand side of the MRI, but the right hip, what you see is a fluid level at the level of the adductor tendon. That is a complete full thickness tear right at that level. And we always get a true AP uh, pelvis uh, T2 image in the coronal plane because you can compare each side that makes it easier to read these. These can be difficult sometimes. So when to operate on these? Interestingly, these do very well surgically. Now, this is not a person who has a little bit of soreness for a few weeks. This is a person with either a traumatic injury or weakness and they have a positive in, uh, Dreyavich sign. These, these are surgical candidates for me. They're almost always late 50s, early 60s females. That being said, they can be males, but it's uncommon. Surgery in this case works very well. I actually do these open, and I would suggest to a lot of individuals, if you operate on the hip, this is easy. Go ahead and do it. Um, it's effectively, you put the person in a lateral position. It's a single incision right over the line, the greater trochanter, about th four, four centimeter incision. It's skin, iliotibial band, and you're staring at the glutes. Uh, at that point, you can put two, two to three suture anchors in and sew it right back down, and they do very, very, very well. Um, some people do it arthroscopically, but I would suggest to you, and I've done it arthroscopically, but honestly, it's easier to do it open. The patients has, have less pain postoperatively, the, there's less fluid extravasation, and their outcomes are better. So I don't do these with a camera anymore. Here's a picture of what it looks like. That's the incision. Um, it's about three to four centimeters. Again, skin IT band, you're looking at the greater trochanter. Anchors go in, I put them vertically, and then effectively just do a side-to-side -side repair of the glute, uh, directly down over the top of the greater trochanter after you use a rongeur to roughen it up and make it bleed. These heal well. I do, I do not use a brace, but I do put them on crutches, toe-touch weight-bearing for six weeks uh, to minimize the hip joint reaction forces. At that point, they can hawk, hike, bike, and swim, and I allow them to load it normally by, at about three months and transition back to whatever they'd like to do with six months. So she's doing well. She's back to all her activities at one year. Her sane's back to 100. These are some are going to be some of your happiest patients, and the surgery is super easy. What about posterior hip pain? Well, here's a 52-year-old female wakeboarder. She was pulled out of water when the boat, jer boat jerked forward, so that's an eccentric load to the hip. She felt a pop, immediate buttock pain. She had difficulty with walking. Um, she had bruising posteriorly and significant bruising, and I suspect a lot of folks in the audience are already going to know what this is. No significant weakness, but she had tenderness at the palpation at the ischial tuberosity. She had pain-related weakness, but she felt like, you know, the hip felt all right. Interestingly, here's her MRI, and what you see is a huge hamstring, proximal hamstring tear. So this is a three-tendon tear. It's about three centimeters off. And I would suggest this is a surgical indication. The sooner you get to these, the better off they do. Um, historically, a lot of times people said, eh, it's one or two tendon tear, less than two centimeters of traction, go ahead and let it, let it sit. A lot of times they do fine. Honestly, that's true, uh, but I would suggest that the one downside to this is you burn a bridge. If you wait on these and it's a true displaced retracted tendon, even a centimeter to two centimeters, going in six to eight months later if they have continued pain is much harder. You end up has, having sciatic nerve scarring, getting the tendon back is more difficult. It's a more complex and danger, more dangerous procedure. So with a complete tendon tear, most of these end up getting surgery in my hands, and I prefer to do them within the first one to two weeks because it is much easier. There's a nice hematoma. It's super safe. The sciatic nerve is already dissected out, and the patients do very, very well. Um, return, return to sports is about, um, what, excuse me, return, return to their normal activities about four to six weeks. Return to sports is three to six months, depending on the repair of the tendon and how they're doing. Um, the uh, surgery, again, complete three tendon avulsion, two tendon tear greater than two centimeters. I would say I, I tend to repair even more of those just because it's a much easier surgery early on. And if patients have continued pain down the road, uh, they're unhappy. 
Chronic tendon tears that are they're a small partial thickness, those you can wait on. The, what I'm saying specifically here, complete tendon tears with retraction, easier to get to them soon, easier to repair them. It's a gluteal crease incision. It's very cosmetic. Uh, you can do it in a transverse fashion. You don't have to tee it. Um, very low risk regarding the sciatic nerve, and you can put it right back to the uh, ischial tuberosity, and they do well. As far as follow-ups concerned, these patients do well. They return to the things they want to do. I would suggest, interestingly, in the past, we've braced these patients in crazy ways, uh, tying their ankle to their hip uh, so that they can't move their, their hip or their knee. We've put them in 90-degree knee flexion braces. Interestingly, recent studies, uh, one, one that came out of AJSM in 2017, as well as my own experience, you don't have to brace them at all. Honestly, I allow them to use crutches for comfort for the first two to three weeks and walk normally. The studies would suggest that does not affect the, the tendon healing. It does not affect their outcome and the patients are much happier with you. Um, so no braces, crutches for comfort and start to walk normally two to three weeks um, as far as the post-op protocols here. So this is a 45-year-old female, right posterior buttock tain, 18 months. She's a high-level runner. She says when she runs and plays sports that require hamstring activation, she has pain. But again, no pop, no bruising, just sort of a chronic pain situation. X-rays overall look fine, no significant impingement, no significant arthritis. Here's her MR. So this is a different story. What you see here is a hamstring tendon tear, but it's not an avulsion. You don't see a lot of fluid around it. There's a small area of fluid between the tendon and the bone. This is called the sickle sign or crescent sign. This is a chronic hamstring tear. This is a different scenario. These individuals, you can wait on, you can take it slow, physical therapy, you can try injections, although I'd suggest cortisone into a tendon is not a great idea. PRP has been used with some reasonable success, although I will say the literature does not support that necessarily, but if you have a patient that really wants to avoid surgery, which is probably a good thing, it's something you can try. Interestingly, if you see that sickle sign, the high signal between the tendon and the bone, these patients do very well surgically as well. The report here, interestingly, said partial thickness tearing of tendinose to the right hamstring, non-displaced to general labral tear, and, acute, and no acute fracture. She came to me for, for an arthroscopic repair of her labrum. That's what she wanted. That was not her problem. That was not her complaint. Rather, she had that sickle sign. She needed treatment for hamstring tendinosis. She actually did not require surgery. She just We treated her for a hamstring problem. She did end up doing fine, and that's what she ended up getting was physical therapy for her tendinopathy. What about the data? Well, the data is there. Ultimately, physical therapy works uh, very well unless you start to have partial retracted tendon stairs or partial ruptures. Generally speaking, these do better with surgery if they have a true rupture. If it's just tendinosis, treat them non-surgically. Open partial thickness tendon tears with that sickle sign do very, very well. Generally speaking, biceps femoris is still intact. Um, you can do it with a three anchor tendon repair. It's actually harder to do than the full thickness tears because you don't have a hematoma and you have to peel the tendon off and find that area um, of the fluid between the bone and tendon, but it's still a very reasonable repair and the patients do very well. Those patients are usually your middle age, and I say middle age because now I am, um, in their mid 40s, generally they're runners. Uh, generally they have posterior buttock pain after running or jumping for long periods of time, but they do very well and return to sports very, very quickly. Follow up. In this case, the patient was happy. Um, she's back to hiking and climbing and doing the things she wants to do. Um, so the lessons learned in regards to the, as far as I'm concerned here, are acute hamstring tendons, get them in early, don't treat them non-surgically. If you see bruising in the buttock with that story, uh, just ask your patient, ask them to get treated, get evaluated quickly, because the sooner you get to them, the easier the surgery is and the safer it is for the patient. If you see that sickle or crescent sign, and they've tried non-surgical management and they're not getting better, don't shy away from surgery. These actually do quite well. Abductor tendon tears do well with surgery if they have a pi po that positive Dreyevich test. If they can hold it up and they're not weak, even with a partial tendon tear on MRI, those are non-surgical from my perspective. They do very well, even though it takes a while for them to get better. Last but not least, FAI is a diagnosis of exclusion in my mind. Arthritis, um, ultimately cannot be treated with surgery. Um, FAI ultimately is a patient who hates sitting. They like standing. They have pain in the groin. They have pain that is relieved by a, a diagnostic uh, ultrasound guided injection. It takes away their pain temporarily. All of those things have to be, all those boxes have to be checked. If they have any arthrosis, 
a lot of people say, well, if you have more than two centimeters or two millimeters of joint space on an x-ray, you'll do well. I disagree with that. Recent studies also come out supporting that perspective, which is ultimately chondrosis of any sort. If you have any sort of cystic formation, the acetabulum, even if they have a normal joint space, those patients don't do well with surgery. So FAI treatment arthroscopically has very good outcomes, but you have to be very, very careful with your, with your operative indications. What about the bones? Well, this is, old, maybe I'll stop for a second. Are there any questions so far about this stuff? No, no we're good. We're good? Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, so what about the bones? Obviously, this is a stress fracture on the top right. That's a big problem. You can see that on x-ray. More, More often than not, we'll see them on the MRI um, mm -hmm. with an occult stress fracture. Those, obviously, that's a tension-sided one, so that's going to get surgery. Compression-sided, usually, you treat with non-operative management. On the bottom right, that's an ischial uh, tuberosity avulsion. That's a patient of mine. She was a 13-year-old dancer, and she hyperflexed her hip uh, when her friend actually pushed her from behind when she was sitting, and she pulled off her ischial tuberosity. That is a surgical indication, and you can see that on the bottom right uh, picture. The reason being, that'll actually heal, but if it does, now the patient's basically sitting with one butt cheek, which is significantly higher than the other, and they end up getting sc skin breakdown and significant problems, so that's a surgical indication as far as I'm concerned. If, they're, if they have any more than a centimeter of displacement with initial tuberosity avulsion, that's a surgical indication. And just like proximal hamstring tears, the sooner you get to those, the better off they do. What about the elite hip? Well, FAI uh, sim sim syndrome for surgery in, with high-level athletes for, versus recreational athletes is an interesting question. Soccer, hockey, and football usually result in the highest frequency of this problem. Cutting and pivoting sports usually result in surgery earlier. High-level male athletes, and Isaiah Thomas is unfortunately a person who's had this issue and been in the media, uh, they're at a two, two to eight times increased risk of cam deformity. They usually ultimately result in surgical intervention with these types of sports, but fortunately the surgery does very well with these patients. Over 90% of these people had chondrolateral labral injury at the time of surgery. Males, FAI syndrome, and sports usually or can result in an increased premature hip OA. So we try to get to these patients earlier if they have symptoms. If they're asymptomatic, we don't touch them. Hockey goalies obviously have severe internal rotation. They're at high risk. Uh, female athletes have better outcomes than non-athletes, in, in, interestingly. Preserve and repairing the capsule and capsule and dancers, as we talked about before with gymnasts and figure skaters, very important. These patients have supraphysiologic motion. Dysplasia is rampant in them. So being very careful to identify dysplasia before operating on them with a camera is important. Overhead athletes, interestingly, like catchers, for instance, do very, very well. Chondral injuries lead to worse outcomes. The reason this matters is ultimately if a patient just kicks this can down the road and they continue to have hip pain, from impingement for months and months and months or years, then the outcomes can become worse. So we try to get to them sooner if they are symptomatic, not if they have an x-ray evidence of a cam deformity or a labral tear, but they have symptoms related to the syndrome. This is my standard x-ray protocol, AP pelvis standing, 45 degree down lateral on a false profile. Um, this is an example of the false profile, alpha angles being elevated, or excuse me, of the done lateral. That's the, can the alpha angle most people are familiar with. Greater than 50 degrees suggests that it's a problem. Labral tears, like I told you before, don't really matter to me. I don't use arthrograms. That being said, insurance companies do require that you, that you identify a labral tear on the MRI to approve the surgery, even though there's that no evidence to suggest that it matters. Um, almost 98, 99% of patients have labral tears, whether it's seen on the MRI or not, unless they're quite young. Uh, just because of the repetitive impact. I do get CT scans if I'm worried about the socket, if they're borderline dysplastic, or if they have a pincer, meaning too deep, then all these patients get preoperative CT scans. We do a very specific protocol, which is half the radiation of a normal CT. Obviously, giving CT scans to young patient, patients is a problem. We did a study on this looking at the number of CT scans that uh, would ultimately have to give someone cancer in it due to the radiation. The answer is a thousand. If you get if you give have CT scans on a thousand individuals under the age of 20, one of them will get cancer from the radiation. So we tr really try not to do that and reduce our radiation risk um, and protocol to minimize that. Uh, ultimately, treatments here, always a mainstay for impingement. We try NSAIDs. Glucosamine and chondroitin are not unreasonable, but this, as you all know, I'm sure the study suggests it's no better than a sugar pill, but if people want to try it, it's fine. Um, activity modification is important. We're doing a sumo squat versus a straight squat has been very helpful in athletes. A lot of, phys um, of personal trainers will tell athletes to keep their knees straight, keep the toes straight ahead, and go down and direct squat. Interestingly, if you have impingement type of hip shape, 
and bringing your your legs out in that mm -hmm. abducted externally rotated position will allow you to squat without impinging it reduces their pain and it, a lot of times that's all that's necessary to make it so their pain goes away and at that point even if they have impingement type shaped hips they mm -hmm. don't need surgery because the symptoms are gone uh, physical therapy can help, obviously, looking at the lumbar lordosis, the, the core strengthening, the buttock strengthening, all very important, and also, also can help individuals post-surgical. Intraarticular injections are very important for me. I do not operate on individuals who do not have pain relief, even as long as it's temporary, uh, prior to surgery. And there are very good studies that suggest that it, an injection of anesthetic into a joint of an impingement patient who is symptomatic, if they get no pain relief from that, with the anesthetic injection, they have a very poor predictable predictability of surgery for treatment of this. It doesn't mean if they get great pain relief for the injection, then their surgery is going to be miraculously take away their pain, although most often it does help them. But if they get no pain relief from the injection, surgery is not going to help them. And so from my perspective, that is a very important part of the workup. The labor repairs, interestingly, significantly improves clinical outcomes. There are a lot of folks talking about labral debridements and newly about labral reconstructions. What I would suggest to you is ultimately if it's there and you can repair it, it's usually better. The studies bear that out. I don't do labral debridements anymore and with very, very few exceptions. Labral reconstructions from my perspective are only in the setting if someone took it out before or if they just don't have a labrum because they have a very deep socket and they've destroyed their own. But I would say that's extremely uncommon. Um, what about the femoral and acetabular osteochondroplasty? That's removing the, reshaping the bone. That outcome is very, very good. These patients do well in the appropriate indicated setting. Conversion to total hip replacement, interestingly, zero to 26%. Now, 26% is terrible, but if you substratify that, in patients, in, in individuals under the age of 40, the conversion risk is less than 3%. Between 40 and 60, uh, the, the conversion rate starts to increase with higher age patients getting more conversion. Interestingly, cartilage, cor the health of the cartilage correlates directly with these numbers. So if you have an MRI with no chondral loss, even in an older individual in their mid late 40s, early 50s, they do very well. I can't, I've never done an ephemeral or acetabular uh, FAI surgery in a person over 55. I never have. That's not to say I won't, but I would say that is very, the very rare bird. Usually these individuals are younger. By the time they hit 55, if they really have impingement, they're usually progressing to total hip. Uh, what about the cartilage damage? This is a 20-year-old male snowboarder performing a jump. Um, he, his left knee hit a tree. If you want to know what it looks like, he brought it in because his buddy was looking doing GoPro. So that's what happened to him. He showed me, this is what happened to me, doc. This is what happened to his hip. He dislocated out the back. And this is an example of that cam deformity impinging in the front and dislocating him out the back. Uh, so at that point, he was doing well. He has a cam deformity. The hip looked good. This is what it looked like. He had a loose body, which I went in to take, take out. And that's what happened to his cartilage. He basically tore all of the cartilage off his, of his entire acetabulum. So that's down to bone. And this is a 20-year-old guy. So that is not ideal. So what are the options here? Well, microfracture has been used. Um, unfortunately, microfracture of the knee has had very poor outcomes. In the hip, it has very good early outcomes, just like it did in the knee. But as you might expect, those outcomes, as we start to follow people in longer term, have worse outcomes. So microfracture, from my perspective, is not something that I use frequently. How about, how about repairing it? Well, interestingly, the cartilage of that flap is not great. It looks okay, but the actual cellular viability is not, uh, not optimal. So we really don't repair these either. Can you restore it? The answer is yes. So this is what I'm doing now. Uh, effectively removing that chondral defect, uh, taking a ring curette to pre pre prepare the interface. This allows us to get a nice bleeding bone at the level of the socket. Um, and again, this is a 20 year old guy. So doing a hip replacement in him is not an optimal uh, op option for him. So we try not to make a lot of bleeding bone, but we get down through that fibrocartilage re lagenous region. And then we can actually harvest the cartilage off the cam deformity. So that's still healthy cartilage, even though it's on an area where we're gonna remove the bone. And normally we just take this cartilage away anyway. But interestingly, in this case, you can actually use uh, the shaver with a little capture device called a graft net um, and effectively remove uh, the cartilage, harvest it, catch it, then do the osteochondroplasty. You can remove that bone, and then you take that cartilage, which was healthy, and you can put it back in the socket where he didn't have any healthy cartilage. So now that it's prepared, you can take the cartilage, which we took from the, car from the femoral side, which he didn't need, and we were going to remove anyway, re-implant it on the acetabular side with growth factors, and then glue that into place with fiber and glue. And this has been used in the knee multiple times uh, called AMIC, 
But in this case, in the hip, we're calling it, we're classifying it a little differently because it does have growth factors added to it. This is not PRP. This, this is just whole blood uh, with the patient's own cartilage. So it's effectively the equivalent of a cartilage version of oats, uh, but it, it can be done arthroscopically at the same time using his own cartilage. You don't have to pay much. It's his own cartilage. You basically put it back in and glue it down and then reduce the hip and it, it conforms it to the acetabular region. And it takes about 30 minutes to do that. It can be done at the same time. So my experience Experience. Effectively, debridement is probably okay for small lesions. Larger lesions, I like prefer. I prefer other options. I do not do microfracture because the outcomes haven't been great, and that's really my go-to at this point. But like most things, uh, follow-up is what really matters, and so we're following these patients. We have early one-year uh, outcomes which show very good results, but there's going to be more to come. So at the end of the day. Uh, return to sports considerations. Make sure your patients are strong. Ninety percent of the contralateral hips. Um, and we think these patients do well with the best with the very close indications. So 